Hello, welcome to this very special edition of the Pace Report. I'm Brian Pace. As part of this year's 2014 Winter Jazz Festival here in New York City, Gary Bartz is making an appearance here with his quartet. And as you might know, this man has been a great luminary to the music as well as the education part of this music as well. As you might know, over the last 50 years, he's played with the likes of Max Roach, Abby Lincoln, Charles Mingus, Art Blakey, and he continues to play with the legendary McCoy Tyner. I sat down with him earlier for a few minutes and we talked about the origins of the American roots music via the blues. We talked about Louis Jordan, one of the pioneering founders of rhythm and blues, which evolved to soul. And we also sat down and talked about his origins growing up in Baltimore, Maryland, and how he's been able to continue to bring this music to the light to the younger generation as well as continue it in the education part of the universities via the band stage as well. So sit back, relax, enjoy the sounds of the Gary Bartz Quartet live at this year's 2014 Winter Jazz Festival here in New York, live here on the Pace Report. Coming back to, to to New York, some of your old stomping grounds. Last night's set was kind of kind of euphoric for not only yourself but for your music fans. Hmm. Well, it it was um, it was short and sweet, <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't have enough time to really show what where it can go. It can go so many different places, you know. So um, I tried to just give a sample of what we do. And uh, I, I, I thought the audience would, I, you know, I love playing in New York. It's my favorite place to play, one of my favorite places. So that's always great because the, the audiences are so knowledgeable. Yeah, I loved it. You know, last night we sat down a little bit briefly and we talked about some directions of this music that I just have seen in the last 10 years. And one of the things that I, I'm really kind of disappointed in, 
a lot of respects is that people are not paying respect to blues mm -hmm. and what it means to the tradition of not just the black American experience, but to American roots music. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mean, that was the first thing, I guess, that I realized uh, listening to Charlie Parker, listening to uh, all the musicians that I loved were blues players. And um, it took me a long time to really realize that the essence of this music is the blues, uh, swing and, and the blues. And so if you're not playing the blues, um, I've actually written a little song based on Ornette Coleman because that's another great blues player on that. King on that, I call him. Uh, and the lyrics are, if you ain't playing the blues, you ain't playing nothing. So um, that's how important the blues are to me. Gary, what do you think has contributed to, one, the 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 lack of the education of blues? And also, it kind of segues into jazz, too, because, you know, one hand washes the other. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think... The blues is like the the uh, the cousin who you don't want to invite over to the house, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, especially when you have other people, you know, who might not understand the blues. But I mean, the blue every music in this country, from from the rock and roll, and and, and it extends to all countries, but from rock and roll, from rhythm and blues, from jazz, so-called jazz, from from pop music, from uh, there's no type of music that has not um, borrowed from the blues. So I mean, it there's no. I mean, when I I realized Charlie Parker was playing the blues on a ballad, you know, I'm listening to Lover Man, and I'm saying, man, he's really playing the blues. That's when it really clicked, and. Um, so so I started studying the blues, and um, I mean, the blues is deep. I mean, it's poetic, it's haiku, it, it's so many things you can do with the blues. Just those 12 bars, and, and that's why when I did, my, I did a, a recording called um, the, the Blues Chronicles, and that well, I was trying to show that there were blues in everywhere, on Broadway, on um, in reggae and country western, you name it, the the blues is there. It's everywhere. What's your take now that you know people are now? You're an educator now, and people are now educators, musicians who are now passing the information of music. What is it now that people need to understand about Duke Ellington? Because I would say about seventy, seventy-five percent of the music that he wrote and composed mm -hmm. was the blues. Yeah. I mean, we, that's that's what it is, I, you know. Like, it, you know, because doing doing my studies, I'm reading about Count Basie and his band, the One O'clock Jump, which was one big song for them. But even jumping into which I had a lot of those songs, they wouldn't play those songs until quarter to twelve, right around midnight, when the party is really getting hot. That's when they started playing the blues, and that just opened everything up. You know, they would play their ballads and play their songs and their other hits, but when, when the things got serious, they started playing the blues. And Duke recognized that, uh, being a master musician that he was, uh, he understood it, and he, he, he dressed the blues up in sometimes in beautiful gowns beautiful suits sometimes in raggedy suits and but he was always it was always about the blues to him yeah <laughs>
Baltimore, Maryland is where you are from, and you kind of grew up musically through the music, through the experience. Tell me the first time that the alto and the soprano saxophone came into Gary Bart's psyche. Well, the first time, I used to go to my grandmother's house on Sundays um, for dinner. And my uncle, Leon Bartz, he used to come to New York all the time. He loved the music. He'd come back with stories about the musicians and the slickest clothes that you could have. And like in Baltimore, they didn't have that. So they called him, his nickname was Sharp. You know, Leon Sharp Bartz, you know, he was always sharp. So um, he had all these records. And that was the highlight of my week, was to go by there on Sunday and listen to these records. And so I first started listening to Louis, Louis Jordan. And Louis Jordan playing the alto, he played alto and tenor, but the alto kind of caught me. And I loved his, his humor, his, the swing, and he was definitely playing the blues. Um, and so that was the first time, but then one day I put on a Charlie Parker record, and that was it. It was over for me. I knew where, I knew my direction in life. And I started following it from that. I was about six years old, six, seven years old. And um, I started begging my parents, I want a, I want a saxophone, I want an alto, because I found out what it was. I didn't even know what the instrument was at first. It was just the prettiest thing I'd ever heard in my life, you know. It was, you know, like a ray of sunshine, like the sun, the sky just opened up. Um, and so it took me five years to convince them, you know, that I really wanted a saxophone. And they finally, you know, when I was 11, they, they bought me a saxophone. They rented me one. <laughs> they still weren't sure. Actually, my dad wasn't sure. My mom was sure. She was always sure. You know, but my dad was, you know, how dads are, you know. Well, you need something else to fall. You know, you can't really make a living doing that, you know. But I said, I'm going to do that. And he, he realized that I was really serious, and he saw my dedication, and so... He, he encouraged me uh, in ways that you couldn't believe, you know, like um, buying a nightclub, you know. I, I, he always wanted a nightclub, but now he had a reason, you know. So I had somewhere to play, somewhere to work out and learn and learn how to be a band leader, learn how to, how to um, conduct myself on stage and, and try out experiments. So I, I could never thank him enough for that, you know.
You know, I want to bring up something that you just brought up just a second ago. Mm. Two very important, pivotal musicians in the black American experience. One being Louis Jordan, mm -hmm. who's the father of rhythm and blues. Yes, indeed. And also Charlie Yardbird Parker, who was one of the purveyors of bebop. Mm -hmm. And your career has kind of dived into both areas. You've played soul music, mm -hmm. and you've also done straight ahead jazz. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about Louis Jordan, one, and that I would have to say that he is what R&B, rhythm and blues, is to what Louis Armstrong brought to jazz music. Mm -hmm. I, I would agree with that. I definitely would agree with that. I mean, he was so, I mean, he was big, really, in, especially in the black community, you know. But uh, uh, growing up in Baltimore, Baltimore was a segregated city. And so we we didn't have many options, you know. We had to... The, and it was a big city at the, at the time I was growing up. It was the, about the sixth largest city in the United States. Uh, but it, we only had two black high schools, one on the east side, one on the west side. Um, so everybody, you know, in the black community knew each other because they all had gone to school with, with each other and their mothers and their fathers and their uncles and, you know, had, they knew each other. So, um, so we had the Royal Theater. We couldn't go to the Hippodrome where Frank Sinatra and, and people like that would play, but we could go to the Royal Theater, which was down on Pennsylvania Avenue where, and I, I had the great fortune to see Louis Jordan's, a couple of his shows down there. And he would come out. He had dancing girls. He had everything. It was just a big show. And he, you know, he was so big. I mean, he was doing movies. He did movies, you know, I've got a lot of the videos now, but what they called then soundies, which are really like videos now, you know. Um, I still have a collection of those, and I watch those old movies. He played cowboys, he played all kinds of things, rode horses, he, he was just something, you know. I, I really uh, um, am sorry that I never got a chance to meet him and know him and talk to him, you know. But he, you couldn't get much bigger than than uh, Louis Jordan. There was a lot of things that he did. One, his technique with the horn, how he played, mm -hmm. and then his band, the Timpani Five. Mm -hmm. This was at a time when the big bands were diminishing, and his his small Timpani Five sounded like a gigantic big band. Well, he kind of set the stage for what later on became what they call what they want to call as I'm. I'm paraphrasing Duke Ellington he says uh, that music that they want to call jazz but but the the music that they want to call bebop because he had a five-piece quintet <laughs> and was making it and I mean he could have had a big band he had a big band too but but it was the smaller group well Louis Armstrong too he had the temp uh, he had the uh, hot the hot fuzz yeah and um so I guess um, smaller groups were always in vogue. Uh, the big bands were, um, I guess they were instrumental in playing more, more arrangements. You know, they were more an arranger's and a composer's uh, showcase, whereas the smaller groups were more showcases for the instrumentalists. And so he kind of set the stage for that. Because for me, there's not much difference between Louis Jordan's quintet and Charlie Parker's quintet other than, um, uh, yeah, different. different. And, and it's not even the different style, because he could have done that too. He did what he wanted to do, because he loved dancing. He danced, you know. I'm reading Stanley Crouch's book, um, you know, the Charlie Parker that he finally, thank goodness, put out. And he, he was... One of the things he was saying, Bird really could dance. Never knew that. He said, Bird could dance. You know, I know Dizzy could dance. Dizzy would dance all the time. But um, Louis Jordan definitely was a dancer because you see him dancing on the shows. You see him in the videos dancing. So, And, and dancing and music, to me, that, that's, they go together, you know, because in Africa and in, in a lot of the 
uh, Eastern countries, music is f is functional. You don't just play music and sit and listen to it. You do something. You know, it does something. It's religious. It's you. You want to dance. You celebrate holidays. You celebrate um, different events during the year. And there are songs that go with these different events. So music is really more functional in in a lot of societies. And I think it's still functional in our society. We just don't recognize it as such. You know, that's funny you say that because when my grandparents were coming up and your parents and your grand, uh, your uncles and aunts, they look forward to going to see Nat Cole oh, yeah. or Diana Washington or the Ellington Orchestra. It was like an event. Oh, it was. And what has happened now? Because it's like now everything, it seems like jazz has become too corporate or just music in general has become too corporate. It's like no one's dancing at the shows anymore. No one's really in tune to feel loose like they would back 30, 50 years ago. I, I think the, um, the emphasis has been on another... Um, another part of this music, which is more like, I, I know people look forward to going and seeing Prince. <laughs> they look forward, they used to look forward to go see Michael Jackson, and they look forward to go see Beyonce and, and uh, Jay-Z and, you know, people like that. Um, so the, it's been an emphasis away from this part of the music, which to me, it's still the same music. Beyonce is not that much different from Donna Washington to me um, because we come out of the same communities, we come out of the same pool, or the same background, you know, so I, it can't be that different. But it's but the industry has tried to compartmentalize everything because they can, you know, money-wise, they can uh, control it a little better you know, by doing that. I think that's got a lot to do with it. But I know, you know, I watch my kids, you know, they, they get ready to go see one of those shows. They're getting dressed. They go out and buy some new clothes, you know. Uh, like you're saying, when, when you're going to see Duke Ellington, you you want to look elegant like he does. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that's part of it. I think the um, the industry itself, and, and that's another thing, like this is – to me, the, one of the biggest money-making industries in the world, and they don't have a contingency plan for the future. Every other industry puts money aside, and, and they have people looking into down the line, how, what are we going to do, how are we going to do, what's going to happen, which direction is. This industry, the music industry, all they are interested in is what's hot right now. And and if this is hot, this is what we're going to do. We don't care about anything else. Which in a way could be good because that's more zen. That's like of the moment. But but we, you know, there are things that musicians are looking forward to doing in the future. And there should be uh, monies put aside to investigate what's going to happen down the line. You know, one of the things I think a lot of people have a lot of respect for you, Mr. Bartz, and it's just in your show last night, and we talked about this. You know, it's okay to play Prince. Yeah. It's okay to it's okay to play songs by Michael Jackson, which you did yesterday. I mean, and what I'm having a hard time dealing with as far as the next generation of jazz artists, mm -hmm. and even some that are in the elder statesman in your category, mm -hmm. they don't want to respect like i say the blues or they don't want to respect soul music they won't play contemporary songs in their sets why do you think that is do you think they want to hear themselves or do you think that it's just that they as a detachment between jazz and r&b that they can't blur i'm not sure i'm really not sure but in my case i just do not see the distinction between the different I mean, it all comes out of the same pool. You know, it's like you go into the ocean and you take a, a cup of water here and to 20, you know, 2,000 miles away, you take it. It's, it's water. It's still water. So the same thing you take out of, you know, you take a Prince out, you take a Michael Jack, you take a Charlie Parker, you take a Duke Ellington, you take a Lester Young, you know. It's the same pool. So... It's almost like um, 
like in a way, racism. Racism is something that it, it, it doesn't really exist except as a political uh, um, device to divide people because s kids do not see colors. The little kids, they don't care whether you're black and white. They don't, they don't even, they, it doesn't even enter their mind. It, it has to be something that they're taught when they grow up. Oh, well, you know, these people over here don't hang out with these people because they're different from... It, 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 no, they're not different, but they're taught different, and I think it's the same thing with the music. They're taught that, okay, this is a different music. It's not a different music. It's the same music. Like I tell, you know, the, the so-called classical musicians who, who say, well, you know, we're, we play classical music, so they kind of look down on other musics, you know. So I always ask them, I said, well, then let me ask you, do you guys have more than 12 notes? <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, we're all working with 12 notes, you know, and so it can't be that different. I don't care what you call it. I mean, uh, like I'm getting ready to do, uh, Ron Carter and I are going to do a cut on a, um, uh album that my friend, the producer, Omas Keith, um, is producing about Bach. And so we're doing a Bach piece. It's music. It's music. And Bach swings. He does, you know, that's that's some old swing. It's a different kind of swing, but it's it still swings. It has a pulse, you know. Um, music is, I, to me, I study music. That's why I, I tell my students, you have to study music. You don't, like they come in and they want to study jazz. I say, if you're studying jazz, you're just studying a part of music. If you're studying music, that's the universe, and that's that's a part of the, you know part of the problem. <laughs> successfully is that you have incorporated a lot of the black experience into what you've done especially the 70s mm -hmm. you did a, a record um, in the 80s a tribute to Langston Hughes and mm -hmm. want to go into a literary icon who just passed away Amiri oh, Baraka yeah. 
And Amiri, going back to what we talked about earlier, wrote a book called Blues People. Oh, yeah. And he broke down mm -hmm. the vernacular of how it existed and where we are now. Yeah. Tell me about the importance of Brother Baraka and tell me why his legacy is going to be missed now in this in this era. Oh, man. I mean, that's that's something that that really, really touched me with with. Um, with his passing and with Youssef Latif's passing. That's why we played a Youssef song last night also, which was like, you can't get any more blues than that, you know. Um, but they understood the essence of this music. They understood it, like Charlie Parker did, like Louis Armstrong, like Leslie Young. And, I mean... Uh, Amiri, I you know I met Amiri and and Yusuf right around in the early '60s. I I met both of them and we became friends, lifelong friends. And he would never Amiri would never cease to amaze me with his words. I mean he could pinpoint, you know, and just just like a musician to me. I mean when I'm listening to him recite his poems or when I'm reading his poems. It's like musicians, you know, they build up to the solo, they, and then bam, they'll hit you, and then, then another chorus, you know. Um, and he was right on point because um, he, he was such a smart man um, and a great writer. And just was, you know, like a lot of uh, writers and a lot of people who write about this music, I, I read their writings, I don't see them. I always saw Mary. He would always come to the gigs. He was serious yeah. about this. He and I consider him, and considered him, and still consider him as a musician, because I feel that you have many people who they never picked up an instrument, or if they did, they never really worked at it like like we do. They had other things like he was a writer. But he was a musician because he could hear better than a lot of musicians who do this for a living. He could hear things better. He would come up and he would say, you know, this guy wasn't really doing, you know, what, what happened on that chorus, you know. He could hear that. So he, he was a musician. And, and so um, a lot of the audience and a lot of people that do come to listen, I consider them as musicians as, as well as we are. They're just musicians who don't play instruments. That'll do it again for this very special edition of the Pace Report. Reporting live at this year's 2014 Winter Jazz Festival here in New York City. I'd like to personally thank the organizers of this year's Jazz Festival, as well as Tiffany Int for allowing me some time with Mr. Bartz. As always, please visit my website, www.thepacereport.com, for my weekly column as well as my past segments. Till next time, remember if it's in the groove, it'll make you move. Till next time, peace. Thank <laughs> you.